Hello. Today we're going to talk about the truth about hormones, weight gain, especially in menopause. So, hi, I'm Dr. Lori Marvis. I'm a board certified family and lifestyle medicine physician who has a really special interest in menopause as I'm also going through this myself. I'll be 54 in October. And let me tell you, things aren't the same as they were even a decade ago. So let's dive deep into the science of what's actually going on during menopause. What are all these hormones and what are they doing to us? I think it's really important to understand it's a very complex physiology that's occurring, but I'm gonna break it down into a few different things that you can probably relate to. And then I'll give you an opportunity to check out my free masterclass where you can learn exactly what's going on in your body and what to do just for you. Because we are all having a different experience. It's all under this thing called menopause, but our experiences are so different and our body's needs are very, very different as well. So that's the important piece to understand. Let me pull up my notes here. Very good. All right. So. Let's get diving into it. So first of all, remember, you know, weight gain is that multifaceted issue. It can in, involves complex physiologic changes. Um, the hormonal fluctuations are very characteristic of this period. Significantly, they uh, impact the weight, um, not only your body weight, but the fat distribution, right? So you notice that things are shifting and where fat is actually stored. So we're going to dive a little bit deeper into what those causes are. And so first of all, I'm going to break it down into four different um, reasons. And then within those four different top categories, I'll go a little bit deeper into the physiology so you understand what the heck is going on. All right. Number one, let's talk about estrogen and weight gain. So first of all, estrogen has a role in fat distribution. So estrogen regulates fat distribution by influencing the activity of a, of a particular type of um uh, thing called LPL, and that spans for lipoprotein lipase and um, hormone-sensitive lipase, which is HL. So I'll just call it LPL, which is the lipoprotein lipase, and um, HSL, which is hormone-sensitive lipase, okay? So let's look at LPL, that lipoprotein lipase. That one promotes fat storage in adipose tissue, in your fat tissue, right? while HCL, the hormone-sensitive lipase, facilitates fat breakdown. So LPL stores, HCL breaks down, okay? Now, lower estrogen levels reduce, reduce the inhibition of LPL, meaning the estrogen halts or slows down the LPL. So if you let the wild thing go, right? Remember that LPL is saying, I'm going into fat storage. I'm going to store fat. The estrogen holds it back and helps inhibits it, right? So that fat storage can't happen as much. Well, if you don't have as much, if the parents aren't around, the children will play, right? They, I think the saying goes, if the cat's, the cat's not in the house, the mouse will play or something like that. Same idea. Um, think of it as a wild teenager. Mom's not around, literally, and <laughs> it's just going to go have a party. Let's store fat here, here, here. So when you have that, so you have lower estrogen, less inhibition of the LPL, and that leads to increased fat storage, particularly around the abdominal region. And we'll get into reason why the abdominal region in a moment, um, because it goes more than just a cosmetic issue of concern. It really speaks to inflammation and it's putting you at higher risk of other things like heart disease and such. But just know that without estrogen, it's not raining in that LPL and, well, there's one reason. Next, you have some metabolic effects um, of estrogen. So estrogen will affect your glucose metabolism and because it enhances what we describe as insulin sensitivity. And when you have a decline in estrogen during menopause, that leads to a decrease in insulin sensitivity, making it harder for your cells to take up glucose. That results in higher blood sugars and increased fat storage because of insulin with hyperinsulinemia, which drives fat storage that is occurring. And that's one of the reasons I like to use CGMs or continuous glucose monitors to discuss with people, are you dealing with insulin resistance? Because there is a way to manipulate your food and food choices, even on a whole food plant-based diet that will better serve you in this transitional time. Next is appetite regulation. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, estrogen modulates appetite through its interaction with a couple of hormones called leptin and ghrelin. So if you think of ghrelin, it's like, I'm hungry. That'll be the one that drives your hunger. Leptin provides satiety, right? It tells you you're full. So hormones usually, um, remember, imbibed. So ghrelin is hunger and leptin is satiety. So lower estrogen levels kind of disrupt this balance, right? And that can lead to increased appetite and calorie intake. Well, because you're hungry. Well, your body thinks it's hungry anyway. Next is we're going to move on from estrogen now. So we had the estrogen. We had the influence on the uh, enzymes, the um, LPL and the HCL. You had the um, metabolism effects on your metabolism for glucose and your insulin sensitivity and your appetite regulation. Next, we're going to talk about progesterone and weight gain. Number one is water retention. So progesterone influences renal function that really promotes um, sodium and water retention. So during menopause, you might notice that you have more fluid retention, right? So you could eat the same salty meal that you did before and not have an issue, but now you're like holding onto water for an extra day. I've absolutely noticed this. So I don't eat a lot of salt anyway, but when let's say we go out to eat and I was like, it was even a healthy meal. I didn't even necessarily taste the salt, but I know they added salt. I was like, what is going on? In a solid day, there was definitely more fluid retention. I was like, what's just going on? So anyway, that can lead to that sensation of bloating and waking. So there's that. Next is also it has an impact on um, appetite. So the progesterone has a known effect on your central nervous system, which is the brain, um, where it interacts with neurotransmitters that regulate your appetite. So reduced progesterone can result in increased appetite, cravings, particularly high calorie foods, right, which contributes, of course, to the weight gain. So there you go. Moving on, let's dive a little bit deeper into what we describe as insulin resistance, right? So what is this mechanism of insulin resistance? So during menopause, the decrease in estrogen affects the insulin signaling pathway, right? So estrogen typically enhances the sensitivity of your insulin receptors, promoting efficient glucose uptake in the cells. But with reduced estrogen, um, this the uh, reduced um, estrogen levels, this kind of impairs that process, leading to the insulin resistance where cells fail to respond to the insulin very effectively, causing the increased blood sugar and um, causing fat storage uh, to occur. So next is this impact on that fat storage. So when we look at insulin resistance, um, you often get this hyperinsulinemia, meaning high insulin levels inside your blood. That promotes fat storage, as particularly around the abdominal region. And that contributes to central um, obesity commonly seen in, you know, menopausal and postmenopausal women. The really important thing to understand here is what's happening there is this is visceral fat as well. And that's wrapping fat and, uh, around your, your viscera or organs within the abdominal cavity, your thoracic cavity, because even discussion around uh, visceral fat coming around your heart, causing increased inflammation. What happens here is that is very metabolically active and it causes a lot of inflammation, which also drives more insulin resistance. And so you get this really nasty cycle that's occurring. So you have insulin resistance, worsening inflammation, which worsens insulin resistance. So you have to take really measured proactive actions to make this halt, right? You have to use data to make different decisions and not get emotional about it. It's just what it is, but you can absolutely tweak it. So even women who are on a whole food plant-based diet may see changes because of these hormone-driven changes, right? Again, these are journals. So just because one person had a beautiful menopause transition during a whole food plant-based diet does not mean that someone else will not struggle. So please don't judge people who choose to make different choices in their menopausal journey, maybe even incorporating hormone replacement therapy like I did myself. Um, so I just want to share that because it's really interesting getting some of the feedback from people about, well, I've had no problems, so you shouldn't either. You know, let's support each other in this journey. And remember, menopause is a time to maybe you're forced introspection. You're forced to look in, inward because you are so uncomfortable. Things are changing. And it's bringing a message of like, hey, I need you to pay attention to me. I need you to do something. And let's utilize that opportunity to make some changes, not only for our current state of health, but our future selves as well. 
um, and teach women differently about this transition, that it can be less painful and not increase our risk for heart disease and osteoporosis and all the things that come with it. But um, anyway, I get off the point. I, now the last thing I want to speak to is muscle mass and physical activity. So you, what you will see is a decline in muscle mass. So menopause is associated with what we describe as sarcopenia. This is age-related loss of muscle mass and strength. So estrogen really plays an interesting role in maintaining muscle mass, and its decline leads to decreased muscle protein synthesis, and that leads to an increase in muscle degradation. Now, the loss of muscle mass um, causes a loss in your decrease in your basal metabolic rate, meaning fewer calories burned at rest. And so it absolutely is 100% able to be reversed by incorporating resistance training, eating enough higher protein foods, which we should be doing to maintain that muscle mass during this time, right? So if ever there's one type of exercise that I would love my ladies to be doing is resistance training. And Watch which kinds using big muscles, dynamic muscles, you know, your thighs and you, the, the more muscles you can use, the bigger muscles, the better, right? Instead of just doing bicep curls, what can you do that, right? Can you do some squats and some deadlifts and lifting it above your head and rows and things using all the back muscles? Lots of people way more uh, qualified to give you resistance training advice like Maxime from Fit Vegan, check him out. But uh, ladies, it's time to lift some, some weights, at least your body weight. You can get started. You can do bands, all sorts of things. Next, we have reduced physical activity. So hormonal changes may lead you to reduce physical activity due to fatigue. You have mood changes um, and other menopause-related symptoms, disrupted sleep patterns, which cause more fatigue, which makes you less likely to want to exercise and do physical activity. I'm here to tell you, though, if you'll just start even with walking, if you're just so tired and like, I can't even do it, walk around the block, walk to the end of your driveway and back. Just do some type of movement to get you going. Start small so it's not overwhelming. And what you will find that over time that you, you're able and willing and desire to move even more because you feel good. Exercise creates wonderful hormones in your and your mind um, and brain, it makes you feel good. You have a better um, well-being, right? And there's, I'm trying to remember how long ago the study was, but there was a study incorporating, and I believe it was Zoloft or Sertraline that they compared it to exercise and um, Sertraline. And the effects were equivalent as far as treatment of depression. And when you exercise, um, research shows that it lasts, those good feeling hormones last for about eight hours. So really incorporating that motion in your body is like, um, I think the saying goes, motion is lotion for your body. Absolutely. I take morning walks every single day. I use that time to reflect, set intentions. I call, call them my mindful morning. Um, and, uh, it's just so very, very, very important that you incorporate some type of movement every single day. And if you're restricted in your movement due to injury or some other uh, disability, do what you can, right? So there, if there's some kind of movement that you can do, please, please do it. Even if it's assisted movement, uh, meaning that you have to sit in a chair to do the same type of yoga move or something, or have someone help you. Maybe it's just passive movement to begin with. But again, looking at what you can do instead of using excuses of what you can't um, is really, really important, right? So let's stop with the excuses about doing what we know we should be doing to improve our lives because we're tired of where we are, right? It's an opportunity now to make a different decision and get a different outcome. So anyway, there it is, guys. And by the way, there's a link to my free masterclass. It's called Master your meta five steps to master your metabolism and lose weight. And I go over the four biggest mistakes people make in the weight loss journey. But the really key thing here is the five steps that you can utilize to understand why and what's going on in your body and then what to do about it, right? Utilize that data and the different um, technologies if you choose to on how to personalize your journey, right? So this isn't just, oh, go eat this or just go do that. This is looking at what, where you are in your current space, what do you need to do about it, and then how to make it a habit, right? So we talk about all of that. And so I'm also 
really encouraged that of the people who um, have taken it, they've gotten a lot of good stuff out of it. Um, appreciate that. And so everyone, uh, thank you again for being here. I so appreciate you. Hope you found this helpful and enlightening. And just know that you're not crazy. Things are changing in the body and there's some serious hormone things going on. And uh, yeah, it, it isn't like it was before menopause, but that's okay. There are absolutely things you can do to make it through this and then come out on the other side of it and even a more amazing human being than you were before. So I'm sending you guys all. I'm so grateful for you and thank you for your time today. I'm sending you joy, love, peace, and healing as we all need more of that in our lives every single day. All right, guys, have a good one and we'll talk soon. 